Welcome to Fueling Your Legacy, hosted by Samuel Knickerbocker. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a new, stronger foundation essential in creating your legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. Fantastic. Okay. Welcome back to Fuel Your Legacy. Today we have an incredible guest on. I actually met him a few months ago. Actually, it's been seven months, eight months. Jeez, it's August already. Uh, eight months ago at a retreat here in Heber, Utah. And you just never know who you're going to meet at some of these retreats you go to. But Stan uh, impressed me right from the start from his, his one knowledge of his industry and what he's doing, but really the impact and influence he's trying to have on society. Uh, we actually have a very similar goal um, and we're just approaching it very differently, um, but, but maybe some stem, stimulus there. Stan, he's a, been a business trial lawyer in Tampa, Florida for 37 years, so a lot longer than me um, doing my profession. And he's been married to his high school, high school sweet, sweetheart for 43 years. So that uh, deserves a round of applause. If you're driving, just give yourself a big wahoo. Um, his book he wrote is uh, the, titled The Unveiled, sorry, Unveil Secrets to a Marriage That Lasts Forever. It's an Amazon bestseller. He's committed to saving a, one million marriages in the next five years. And that's where, uh, when I heard that goal initially, I was like, man, this is somebody I need to have on here at the right time. Um, he's, had, he's created a digital course called the diamond relationship formula, and then he conducts workshops and does mentoring, helps people transform their relationships uh, so that they uh, can really have the relationship and create the relationship of their dreams. Um, my goal is to help people create the legacy of their dreams. And uh, as, as we talk about today, you're going to find out how absolutely uh, crucial a solid marriage is in creating a lasting legacy. So super excited to have you on, Stan. Uh, give a little bit background of, of who you are, your family, how you got into maybe business lawyer and why you're now transitioning into almost a marriage therapist counselor type positioning. Okay, I am the oldest child. I was born in South Carolina. My dad was an engineer for the federal government. So we moved around a lot when I was a kid, a little bit like being military. I lived in, let's see, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, state of Washington, and ended up in Kentucky when I was in about the, well, about the time I started first grade. So I grew up basically in Kentucky, five years in Frankfurt, eight years in Bowling Green. And my dad, he was very close to his older sister. And at one point he was describing me to his older sister and he said, well, uh, Stan's really only interested in two things, chicks and baseball. And, uh, when I, after my junior year of high school, we moved to Alabama. He opened a branch of his business. He was a civil engineer. And I would, uh, went to work at Burger King. And then I met the only girl that would ever matter again. The only chick that ever mattered since. Uh, I met her a few days after she turned 16. I was 17. Uh, our first date was very few days after that. That was her last date with anybody else ever. And we got married when she was 17, I was 18, and that was 43 years ago. That's incredible. It's just, just, I can't imagine that right now. I've been married for four years. I've loved every second of it, but 10 times that, that's a long time, almost 11 times that. Yeah, well, you know, we had, we had all of the, the challenges that you have when you marry young, that young. I mean, I don't know anybody else that married that age and still married. Uh, we went through college, had a first child, law school, had a second child, moved to Tampa after I finished going to school at Duke, and we had our third child uh, three years later, so while I was a young lawyer working crazy hours, and after about 10 years of that, I started my own law firm, so I became my own business owner, and you work the hours you do when you do that, and then we both became very active in our church. I served in ecclesiastical positions for more than a decade where I had a lot of day-to-day -day responsibility for couples, working with and counseling with them, marital issues, family issues, children issues. And I began to realize between the courtroom and the, uh, the, the church that there are very, there are principles and practices that are common to successful marriages, 
and there are principles and practices common to unsuccessful marriages. And if somebody just teaches you the pattern and teaches you the steps to a successful marriage, you can make it. And, and the motivation for me is I have not ever been a family lawyer, but I have seen too many friends get divorced. I've seen what divorce does to children, and it makes me sick to my stomach. You know, if you read the statistics, uh, read the research on effects of divorce on kids, they're two times more likely to attempt suicide, 300% more likely to need psychiatric counseling in any given year, more addictive behaviors, more high-risk behaviors, more educational problems. They even hit, tend to have lower lifetime earnings. So when parents get divorced, they say, oh, the kids will be fine. That's a complete selfish cop-out. Now, from time to time, there really are marriages that they're better off being out of. Any home that's abusive, the kids need to be out of, the other part, the spouse needs to be out of. But short of that, the grass is always greener. I'm really just not happy. Sorry, make it work. That's what you owe your children for bringing them into the world. My view. Yeah. No, I, uh, I don't disagree with you. For sure. I, I think it's an interesting thing. I, I studied neuropsychology and uh, my journey into the financial world was really through a process of I grew up seventh of 11 kids and uh, the, our family wasn't very great. Like my parents, they were abusive on two different fronts. My mom was very verbally and physically abusive. My dad was super neglectful and just would sit there and watch it happen. And so it didn't, it didn't seem like, um, there, there was a lot of support there. And then the, we never struggled with malnutrition. Actually, we always seemed to eat pretty well, but uh, when it came to anxiety, depression, like the whole slew of things that come from a lack of financial education. And that's where I saw it in the research when I was going through, I was like, how can I help families like my, my own? Um, and I started wiggling down the research and really a lot of divorce, a lot of um, abuse, domestic violence. I mean, the whole list of things come down to uh, a lack of financial education. And so that's why I, I'm approaching the same goal. I want to save a million marriages or families or children. That's awesome. I, I love it. Not to piggyback on your goal, but I'd love to sit, be able to lay claim to that. But I want about the same thing, because, but I came at it from a uh, still psychological research, but a financial perspective of, man, what is this financial aspect of somebody's life? How is that impacting the, the future? And how can I solve that rather than trying to just help people psychologically? That's good. Everybody, I think everybody should go to a counselor, honestly. Even if you think you're good, you probably should go see a counselor, <laughs> especially if you think you're good. No, but, um, but yeah, that's where it changed for me is seeing the research, seeing what what, how could I actually make an impact? So I love that that's what you've chosen to do. Well, that's one of the approaches that I took in the book is, look, there, there really are four questions every couple ought to ask before they say I do. And it's sex, money, children, religion. Those four. You really have to have, you got to get aligned on those and you got to get educated on them. So your financial education is dead on. One of the things I saw in my ecclesiastical position was too many young couples they're getting married at 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old and expecting to live the lifestyle their parents have created after working for 30 years. The math doesn't work, particularly when you look at the debt load that kids are taking on to get degrees. If we take that financial education and let's back it up even, let's get them back when they're in high school and say, let me teach you how not to get into debt, but let me teach you before you start applying to colleges Let's talk about what you want, what kind of income that degree is going to produce, and now let's look at what school you're going to go to because to go to an Ivy League school and get an, a, a liberal arts degree is a financial pit that you, you can't dig out of because part of what ki we don't teach enough that kids is if you come out of college with massive student loans, you're never going to own a home because you can't qualify for a mortgage. You're in, your debt to income ratios won't work. So why, why spend $300,000 getting a degree that's gonna pay you $40,000 a year job? The math doesn't work, but you need to educate people on how to do that analysis. Absolutely, yeah, no, that's, a, that's one of the reasons I switched. That's another uh, convincing reason of why I switched out of psychology. I, when I was going through, I had one really tough teacher. I appreciate her. She was the hardest teacher I ever had. She said, look, you need to go interview your future and you better interview them good. 
And I was like, okay, so I, I love neuropsychology. I love biochemistry. I love the, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I went and interviewed five or six of these people. And I did a lot of research online. Like, what's the average income of these people? And right. I, top, top level neuropsychologist. Uh, if you're not working for an, like for a teaching institution, but you're at a, at a company or something, you're maybe making two fifty to $300,000 a year, maybe, but you've got to go to school for 13, 14 years. So I wouldn't be done with school till I was 35 and I would be in thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. I'm like yeah. that. And then you're basically owned by those institutions and you, you have to be publishing to keep your PhD doctorates up, up and everything like the amount of time it would take. It wasn't the lifestyle, family lifestyle, religious lifestyle that I wanted um, with, with the money matching up. So I was like, okay, I need a, a more lucrative career, but still have the same impact. And finance is one area that uh, fulfilled both of those for me. So man, I hope you teach that principle everywhere you can. And the younger you can teach it, the better because kids have such unrealistic they have no understanding to start with of what the lifestyle their parents provide for them cost. And they don't understand even how to do the analysis that you just went, that you went through. Your experience would be incredibly valuable. It ought to be a required reading for every high school senior. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. There's only three states in the country that require any level of financial education. Utah is one of them, but um, I meet with people all the time. It's like, oh, how, what did you learn about finances? They're still teaching people how to balance a checkbook. It's like we haven't used checkbooks in this country like regularly in a decade or longer, right? And it's just like it's so archaic of knowledge and you're not learning. You're, you're barely learning about inflation. You're hearing a concept of compound interest with no application. And it's just like there's so many things that are just not taught. And, and then you have it exactly right. People are living these, these lives that are not a great book about that actually is um, the millionaire next door. Um, whether you like it or love it, there's a lot of people who try and discredit it. The fact is one of the best things about that is understanding um, the, like his key that he talks about under accumulators, wealth, average accumulators, wealth. And I forget what the other one is, but basically people who have accumulated large amounts of wealth and what they do, how they cripple their children by trying to help them live that, that lifestyle. So you might have a lot of money as a parent. So you then say, well, my parent, my kids, they need help to get a car and a house. So then I'm going to go buy them a house or buy them a new car because I have so much money that I've accumulated and want to help them. But now your children, now they have this big house and they need to go furnish it. So then they go down to Ashley furniture store, RC Willie or wherever, and they just go into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt trying to furnish these things trying to pay for repairs on their cars, whatever that they wouldn't have had to do if they never had the house to begin with. And so anyways, that book is phenomenal at nailing down where the, the little tiny ticky things are that set somebody up for wealth or poverty. It's, it's an incredible book. So wow. yeah, uh, that's awesome. So when, so you were, you were doing business law for, um, thir- I mean, 37 years. What really, what was the, the final straw on the camel's back? What broke it and said, look, I've got to get out of this business trial lawyer stuff. I need to be, I can have a much bigger impact here and where you really launched into that aspect of your life. Well, I still am a full-time practicing trial lawyer. What I've decided though is that it's legacy for me. You know, as a trial lawyer, I can help individual clients and I might have 25 cases a year. And, and many of those, are for this, I represent companies a lot. So I'll have relationships with a business owner. I'll do multiple things for them during a year. But to reach, to have a broader reach, to have a broader impact, I have to be able to teach one to many. And one to many I can do digitally. One to many I can do in seminars. One to many I can do in retreats. Because the way I look at it, every couple that I impact, I impact two, three, or four children. And so what I look for is, I love to be able to get young couples, get them, in, get my book in their hands, get my course in their hands, and set them up for mar- a successful marriage. Because the divorce statistics in America are just as bad as the for the adults. I mean, you talk about forty to fifty percent of first marriages and sixty to seventy-five percent of second and subsequent marriages end in divorce. Why? You you can change that pattern. So I would work with I work with people who are getting ready to get married. 
work with people who have marriages they consider to be broken. Work with people who have, it's kind of like, you, you know, people that have never really had any tragedy in their marriage, but over time they just kind of grow apart. So you kind of, the relationship is cooled off. The magic's not there. What if you could plan your marriage so that the honeymoon lasted forever? So that you had love, joy, passion, connection every day. And even if you have a good marriage, let's make it great. If you have a great one, let's make it epic. I mean, there's a reason that Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, and, and LeBron James all have coaches. It's not because they're not already the best in the world, because they want to be better. We all have to, where we invest our time, our resources, is where we improve. If you want financial education, you're going to have to go out and get it. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to take the knowledge and apply it. And then you're going to hit a level and go, okay, now I need to go to the next level. You do the same thing in your business. We're very intentional. Like our physical goals are easy. Mm -hmm. I want to weigh this much. I want to do this. I want to run eight minute miles. Our business goals can be very deliberate, very intentional. Most people have a much more difficult time setting relationship goals. How do you measure it? Well, I did. I came up with a way to measure it. I actually have a formula to allow couples to measure the quality of their relationship today and to quantify the change over time. That's incredible. Do you have a way that people can get access to it online or how, how does somebody go through and take that formula test? Is it in your book? Where, where do they get access to something like that? There is, it's online on the website. It's relationshipmagicacademy.com. Uh, but if you don't, if we've got two minutes, I'm going to do it with you right now. Go for it. Let's, let's do it. All right, let's do it. The formula is QR equals QQCC. All you need is a piece of paper. And you're going to write down three numbers on a, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest, write down the quality of the questions you and your spouse ask yourselves and each other. One to 10. And, and this is one of those places where brutal honesty is important. Fooling yourself, you don't know where you started. Second question on a scale of one to 10, what is the level of your commitment to each other in the marriage? And this is, you don't have to show your spouse your score, so you can. Yeah, no. Uh, that's hard. I don't know. That, that's a hard thing to gauge. All right. What's the third question? Or is that not, not yet? Isn't there? Okay. The question, you look at and say, hey, what's the, what is one to 10? Quality of your questions, quality of your commitments, quality of your communication. Is the third one. That's verbal, nonverbal, positive, negative. What's the quality of your communication? Now, here's the the key to the formula. Multiply the three numbers. Tell me what you came up with. So, so, so mul multiply each one times three, or multiply add them all together times three. Three numbers by themselves. If you got eight, 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 multiply those three together. Multiply them times each other. So, like eight times eight times eight times eight. Yep. Okay. So. I'm gonna have to pull my calculator out. My mind's not working that well right now. Okay, got it. Five oh four. Okay. Now realize that if you're if you're at the highest level, if each one's a ten, ten times ten times ten is a thousand. You just scored five hundred and four on a thousand point scale. Okay. That's pretty sucky. No, it really isn't. I had, I had a, a very successful woman who took the, the test, and she came out at 125. But here's the cool thing. Take any one of those and improve it by one number, and then tell me what the math is. Well, if I improve the first one by one, then I go up to 567. So you had a 10% increase by an incremental change. Yeah. So what you can do is there are small steps, processes, tools, hacks that you can use to move every one of those up. And if you just move each one a little bit, you've made a, if you move each one by one, you made a huge difference. You mm -hmm. get them all toward nine, toward 10. You're talking about having a relationship where you wake up just lit up every day. Like I get to wake up next to her. The rest of the day is good. 
Right. Yeah. No, that, it's an interesting thing. I think that, uh, I mean, I'll be, I'll be, uh, I have no problem being open about my numbers, but just cause I think this is a good, good, uh, tr- test, but I think the first one, pro- which is the, uh, yeah. questions, the, the reason it's hard for me is cause I, I, I think my questions are really good, but maybe she doesn't think they're as good, but we have really, I, most of my, and this has been from the beginning of our relationship. I've always sucked at, uh, what's they call like the lighthearted speech. What do they call that? Small talk. Yeah. yeah. Small talk has never really worked for me. I'm, we always are talking about deeper, yeah. either doctrinal from a religious perspective or like life things that principles that apply everywhere in our life. And we have these conversations. That's all we talk about. So that's great. And, could and they be better? Can, Probably help you. I would teach you with this is when you're talking about the questions you ask yourself, what you're really wanting to, to focus on are, are you in asking empowering questions, questions that move you forward or give you solutions, or are you asking questions that are negative in nature? So here's an easy example. If you're, let's take your wife because it's easier. If you do something that irritates her, she has two choices. She can say to herself, why does he always do that? Or... I wonder what's going on in business that we haven't talked about that caused him to react. What yes. do those two questions produce a different feeling? Absolutely. Oh, 100%. The second one is a thousand times better. Like what is really going on here? Not, well, not what's happening. Say, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, you can either pound the steering wheel and scream at them, or you can say, I wonder if his wife is lying down in the back seat and she, he's driving her to the emergency room. Mm-hmm. Different feeling? Absolutely. And it changes. When you change you, which is all you can do, you cannot change your spouse, but you can change you, and that changes the relationship. And if I can work with both of you, and I can get her to move up and you to move up, that's it, better. It, becomes, it becomes an amazing thing. That's that, really what I wanted to share with people. I want, I have had an amazing 43 years. Now, has it all been sunshine and roses? No, of course not. We got married so young, I was a jerk. Let's just be real. It, and unfortunately, she was patient enough to let me grow up, to catch up. We were busy. We both had, she had kids, I had a job, I had you know law practice. Then in the church, I spent an enormous amount of time in the position. And then we lost two grandchildren. Those were the hardest experiences that we've ever had. But we had enough of a, a reservoir of trust and respect and love built up that when the tragedies came, we leaned on each other. So it pushed us together, not apart. And what we want to do, I want to help everybody build this giant reservoir of love and respect and trust with their partners so that the world, all the pressure the world does is put them together. It can't pull them apart. That's the principle. I, I love it. I love it. So how in your, in your journey, I, um, this question comes to mind just cause I look at things from a, a financial perspective. Okay. So that's, that's the way my mind works. Um, but how is like a business contract I and mean, your business trial lawyer that sometimes means, uh, business partners divorcing each other and fighting over stuff, right? How is a, a, a marriage contract similar to a business contract and, and how would it shift in your mind if, if people were to treat um, their marriage a lot more like a business or less like a business, would it impact their marriage? Okay. It's a great analogy because what happens is if you and a friend decide you're going to partner up on a new financial services company, it's look just like you're, you're engaged. You're excited. Everything's positive. You can't imagine anything is ever going to be difficult or go wrong. And so in business, what people do is they tend not to get things in writing. We don't have a plan for what happens if you and I get to the point where there's a major decision and we don't agree on it. You own 50%, I own 50%, what do we do? In, the, in, a, in a marriage, I don't, I don't, you know, very wealthy people have always done prenuptial agreements. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a very structured communication with that your, your prospective spouse, where you go through, you know, sex, money, children, religion, and you think about, let's talk about these, because every two people come with a completely different set of experiences. 
your wife grew up in a different household, different experiences, maybe a very loving, nurturing type of, of parent relationship that you didn't have. Okay, how is that going to affect the way the two of you interact? How are you going to then deal with your children that you're going to have together? What are the standards that you're going to expect from your children in terms of behavior? What are the consequences, the types of discipline that you're both going to impose? Because you have to be united. You know, the same thing with, with religion. You know, people from different religious backgrounds or even the same religious background have very different levels of commitment to it, observance of religious practice. Where are you? Where am I? And most important, where are we going to raise the children? What are we going to do then? And then even on the religious one, you often can even get in-laws become a big issue. Your family, her family is the dynamic that you two are comfortable with going to create friction with one set of in-laws or the other. Then you got the money issue. Do you have one spender, one saver? At least you hope you have one saver. <laughs> yeah. No. You have two spenders, you just have you know, a nuclear explosion waiting to go off. Just let it happen. Um, on, on sex, either you're going to have people come to the relationship with no experience, which is, frankly in our society is probably rare, what are their expectations of each other? Maybe they have or haven't explored that physically before. And it's more difficult if they have no experience, but they need to have the conversation because they need to be respectful of each other. So you get them, then you get the, you know, sex, money, children, religion. The children becomes even more difficult when you have a second marriage. My children, your children, our children. Who's going to discipline? Are, are, are we both going to discipline all the children? Or what are the standards? Because these two sets of kids have been raised in different homes, and they're probably going back on a part-time basis with the two exes who are going to have different standards in their home. That one is very, very difficult. That's one of the primary reasons that second and subsequent marriages fail at such a high rate. Hmm. Yeah, th those are all good questions. I know that for me, before my marriage, it was... And I asked a lot of those. I don't think I asked all of them for sure, just because I didn't think to. But I asked a lot of them primarily around um, treatment of others. And I know that you may disagree with this. I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. For me, my wife is like number one above my children, above everybody. And if it comes to push or shove, then children are lower on my list than my, my relationship with my wife. And uh, sometimes that it was unsettling for her or, or uh, she thinks that it shouldn't happen that way. I'm like, well, for me, that's you, you, we have to be okay. And we have to be united before we can ever talk about anybody else. Another thing that I, I came into the relationship with this is my opinion, right? But I'm, I can love myself enough that I don't need my wife to love me. And communicating that to her, she thought that meant that I didn't love her or that I wasn't committed to her. And there's, there's a big difference uh, from a psychological perspective between codependency and interdependency. Agreed. And, and codependency is an abusive relationship. Interdependency is two independent people allowing themselves to depend on each other. And um, I came in saying, look, I am not codependent on you. I don't want you to be codependent on me. If you choose to leave, that will suck. I'm, I won't enjoy it, right? I'm not saying I want this to happen. But also, if that's what you choose to do, I'm not going to chase you because that's your choice. And I don't need you in this relationship for me to survive. And for her, that took that, staying that, saying that to her, she didn't like it very much initially. She told her friends, they all were like, he's, he's terrible. You should get away from him, right? But now, four years into our marriage, just one of the things she loves the most is that she, how she's choosing to live her life and her emotional roller coaster isn't dictating how I'm living my life and my emotional stability. And that allows her a lot actual more stability than she would have if I was, you know, uh, tailgating or hooky bobbing. You are emotionally strong enough to withstand the storms of her emotions. And that's pretty much what every woman needs for a man. She needs that ability. Um, 
But I think too, you have one of the things that, that we all have to have when we're really trying to create a deep connection. One of the kind of examples I came up with is you think about the space shuttle. We have, a, we have an international space station and we used to send a shuttle up to go and dock with the space station, resupply it, take away waste, bring new astronauts, all of those kinds of things. But think about the mechanism. When the two things are going to dock, they have this big gate that lines up and then interlocks. If we are so self-contained that we truly don't need anybody at all, we have no docking station on us. Nobody can really attach. We have to be willing to open a portal that lets them hook on because otherwise the connection between us doesn't exist. We can be roommates, but we're really not passionately connected. And to some extent, I, I did that. Look, I, I'm going to admit when I was uh, when I was younger, I equated emotion with weakness, and I was the rock man. I had walls. I was not going to allow anybody to get to the point where they could hurt me. But I also it, that's sort of when I figured out. But if they can't, if you can't feel pain, you can't feel joy. It's, it's a two way street. You know, it's sort of like when you pick up one end of the stick, you get the other. If you're so closed off that you refuse to be hurt, and, and I deal with an awful lot of women who have gotten to that point. Their relationships have been uh, abusive with toxic spouses. They've been all those things. And they've said, I will never date again. I will never marry again. I don't want to be, I'm never going to let anybody close enough to hurt me. And I say to them, well, do you want to feel joy? How you, do you have you felt any recently? No. So that's why when you close it off, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel pain. It doesn't feel pleasure. You've got to make a decision. Are you going to be vulnerable to the world? Do you have to be vulnerable to the point of self-destruction? Of course not, but you got to be vulnerable enough to create the docking station because that's how you create a connection that makes you, uh, Steve Covey calls interdependence something that I view as one plus one equals three. It's two independent people who make a choice to be with each other because they are better together than either of them would be separate. Yep. That's, what, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I see that in the financial realm, especially after a divorce. I see it more with women than with men, uh, but women, I, th I think it's, from, from the psychology perspective, they've never been in charge of finances. A lot of them, they are not the breadwinners. And so the, the biggest obstacle to getting out of an abusive relationship or a relationship that they were hurt in is the financial as aspect. And so when they finally do separate off and, and they become their own individual, then they build what I would consider, I'm, I'm from farmland up in Idaho, so I think in different analogies maybe, but I think of like silos and they build this armory of a silo paint it really pretty on the outside, but it's completely empty on the inside. The feeling, the joy, the everything that they need, it's all empty on the inside. On the outside, they look like they're way put together. They generally will triple their income that they've ever earned or whatever they were earning with their, their spouse. They'll go triple that and they'll just be this fortress of finance. But when you look inside, all of their spending habits are all sedation to the pain of having no other meaning in their life. Um, and it's, it's sad to see, but it's also nice that I can see it on a number scale. I know exactly what's going on in somebody's life or, or dang near close to going on in somebody's life just by looking at, hey, where's their money at? How much are they earning? Where's it going? And, and what are they spending on? And then I know where you're at psych psychologically and we can have a, a conversation that's actually going to heal everything, not just the financial side. That's awesome. because I, you know, I had a, uh, a, a friend, a female friend once who described that as retail therapy. Yes. Well, here's the... Here's one of the aspects of, of the cost of divorce. We talked about the cost of divorce on children, but on most American families who are living paycheck to paycheck with very limited savings, divorce means a dramatic change in lifestyle. Because if you were living paycheck to paycheck with limited savings and you had one household, you have the same amount of income, but you're now supposed to support two households. I went to law school because I couldn't do math. 
but I can, I can do that math. It doesn't work. So you see significant financial hardship on both sides. And then you see people who spend crazy about some money with lawyers. If you think getting divorced is cheap, it's not. I actually have one wealthy client who over the course of several years of very nasty litigation spent $6 million in legal fees. Now, the average divorce in Florida, contested divorce, I saw one statistic that said $35,000. That's not even close. Here's what I can tell you exactly how much your divorce is going to cost and exactly how long it's going to take. Doesn't matter where you live. Here's the answer. It's going to take all your money and it is going to take as long as it takes the lawyers to get all your money. That's it. Yep. And then if you have kids, you're still going to have to deal with that ex-spouse till the youngest child is 18 and probably beyond when they start having kids of their own. And you want to see the grandchildren. You want to be at a grandchild's christening, baptism, blessing, whatever it is. But I will tell you, I have seen very, very few relationships end and the parents be able to be civil to each other and act in the best interest of the children. It just almost doesn't happen. Yeah, that's it's it's crazy. So so what what did you say? I mean, we talked about a lot of different things that you help people with. What would you say your secret weapon is? Your your secret habit, mindset, or behavior that you you feel has created um, or given you the ability to create your meaningful legacy? And like, what? How could we adopt that one secret into our life to really expand or improve our our marriages or our relationships? All right, I'll tell you what. I'll give you the sticky, the sticky note secret. The Perfect. Bad secret, okay? Each of you, you and your spouse, take a yellow sticky pad. Every single day, write one thing on the sticky pad that you love or appreciate about your spouse and put it where they will find it. And every single one has to be different. You can put it on their mirror, their underwear drawer, on the refrigerator, in their, on their, you know, the uh, steering wheel of their car. Somewhere they're going to find it. Because it will force you to think about not the things that you're, they annoy you with, but the things that you love and appreciate about them, the blessing they are to you. And think about the feeling that will create in them. How many days do you think it will be before your wife starts to go looking all over the house for that sticky note as soon as she wakes up? Yeah, what probably week? a week, maybe. Maybe two days. <laughs> maybe two days. Well, it may take a week because she's not going to believe it for that long. She's gonna, eh, yeah, that's fine. That's nice. But if that happens day after day and you are thinking of the new things that you love and appreciate and can genuinely compliment her on. I mean, I had an experience this past weekend. We went to help the family move. And the, the condition of the home in terms of the cleanliness and neatness it was awful. And I went home and I put my arms around my wife and I said, I just want you to know how much I appreciate the way you have always kept our home. I got a great reminder today. Thank you. She's like, okay, but that's, it was, it was a sincere compliment because I was, I was sitting there thinking in that other house, I wouldn't spend five minutes here. I'd have turned around and walked out. That's not the way we've lived. That wasn't her standard. So if you would do just that one thing in 30 days, that'll change your relationship. Awesome. I love it. So where, where can we get the best access to you? Do you hang out on Facebook, Instagram? Uh, are you on social media at all? Some, some people are, some people aren't. So where can we get the most access to you? And how, if somebody's listening to this thinking, man, I wish that I could improve my relationship, where can they get access to Stan so he can help them work through that? Okay. Go to the website. It's relationshipmagicacademy.com. Uh, it, it's on Facebook, Relationship Magic Academy. It's on, there's an Instagram and I am going, I do events. I'm going to do a series of events with a lady named Dr. Sherry Campbell. She is a best-selling PhD therapist, written a book called, But It's Your Family on Toxic Family Members. And we're doing a two-day workshop in Tampa on the 4th and 5th of October. We're doing one the 1st and 2nd of February of next year in Newport Beach, California. And then the 24th and 25th of April, we'll be back in Tampa. She lives in California. I live in Tampa. So we just move them back and forth across the country. 
but we get the opportunity to do that, and then we get to work with people on a more intimate level. So we'll do the coaching. We've got the courses available on the website, and I love to talk to people, love to interact with them on Facebook. It's, it's fun to help people, and that's, you know, I, I told my kids when I turned, uh, my grandkids when I turned 61, I said, look, guys, if you get me a birthday cake, put one candle on it because this is the first year of my second 60. And mm-hmm. this is what I'm going to do for the next 60. No, that's awesome. I love it. And it's given the way medical advances are going, if we are even a little bit mindful of our health, very likely we'll be over 100 years old. It's crazy. Uh, I know. It's nuts. Kind of exciting. Kind of like every day when you look at the news, if you watch the news ever, every time you see it, you're like, man, do I want to be here for another 60, 100 years or whatever, right? Um, but I think the ultimate answer is yes, we do want to, to be here for that long. So um, this week, we on Wednesday, we reviewed the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. What do you like specifically about that book? Like what what about that book do you think helps or communicates to a couple or helps them? Oh, that's, it's one of my favorite books because as a lawyer, you can imagine that I'm kind of left brain, logical, linear thinker. For the first 20 years of our marriage, I would come home. Linda would start to tell me about a problem or a challenge she had that day. I would tell her the solution and she was unhappy. And I was confused. I'm like, she asked me a question. I answered the question. What's, I solved the problem. What's next? I read the book and I was literally rolling on the floor and thinking, this is us. What you, what I learned is that all she wanted was for me to stay awake while she was talking, pay attention and listen to her. She wasn't broken. She didn't want to be fixed. She already knew what to do. She simply wanted me to listen and validate her feelings. So here's the secret guys. You can actually win by keeping your mouth shut. And all you have to do at the end is say, honey, I know that must have been difficult. Is there anything you would like for me to do about it? The answer will almost universally be no. And you won. You're a hero. And I'll give you one for the ladies. Ladies, if I can tell you how to get anything you want from your man. Let's hear it. Okay, wait, wait. Don't stop. Okay. Men don't get clues. We don't get little clues. We don't get medium size. We don't get huge clues we just don't get it if you want to talk in clues that's what your girlfriends are for if you want something from your man you get his undivided attention that may literally mean he gets up in his face if necessary put your hands on the side of his face and say honey i want to go see this chick flick and i want you to take me to baskin robbins and 99 times out of 100 he'll say okay because all he wants is for you to be happy because when you're not happy his life stinks and he knows it but when you want him to guess what you want, you're setting him up to fail and yourself to be unhappy. So from this point forward, if you listen to this broadcast, ladies, if you don't get what you want from your man, it's your fault. Good. Good. No, I'm just kidding. I agree. I think that direct communication is the only, in my life, it's the only way to survive. Cool. Um, whether it hopefully it's all kind and i think as in the beginning asking the right questions from everything and they don't always have to be audible questions maybe in the the beginning audible questions help but sometimes just the the internal questions hey what i ask the question what might also be true you know like i i might be frustrated at this but let's look at a situation objectively what might also be true um what might also be going on. And when you start thinking in terms of that, um, then, then your, your, the, the relative bad of what is happening can, can be really positive. If you just think of a few things that could be worse then everything in life is great. Um, I, I think actually, Sam, I think your internal, this, your internal story is more important than the external one because you're going to attract what you think about all the time. And we, all, we both know people who, are, who say one thing and are thinking something different, and you literally can see it in their eyes and on their face. The internal story, if you can focus on the positive and say, well, okay, maybe that was not a great thing, but here are five things they did wonderful that I love about them. You change your dynamic immediately. And no matter what it does for them, 
it changes you. It attracts more of the positive behavior to you and it lets it doesn't allow you to be overcome by their bad mood, bad attitude, bad feeling, whatever. You it, it allows you to maintain your own equilibrium on a much much better basis. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I love it. Awesome. So this next section that we're going to talk about is called Legacy on Rapid Fire. We're going to ask you five questions. It's a one word to one sentence answer. Um, and we're this is basically find out where you're going and, and how, how you're getting there. So first question is, what do you believe is holding you back from reaching the next level of your legacy? Organization. Okay, and what do you believe the hardest thing you've ever accomplished is? Surviving, burying two grandsons. Okay, and what do you believe your greatest success to this point in your life has been? My family. What is, uh, I'm gonna ask you again, what's one secret you believe contributes most to your success? Confidence. Okay, and what, what one book, if you could recommend just one book to the Fuel Your Legacy audience to help them improve their, their relationships, what would it be? Five Love Languages. Awesome, there you have it, Five Love Languages. That is one of my favorite books. I think the, another, just, just along this relationship um, topic, things that have helped me, I think, the most in my relationships, because uh, I, I think I come from just a communication error right? Love, five love languages. Awesome. But the, the anatomy of peace by the Arbinger Institutes, um, phenomenal book to understand that your spouse or your business partner, whoever that your relationship with is, they actually are a human and that they deserve to be treated as such instead of an object of, of pain for you. And then the other one is the four tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Uh, I don't know if you've read any of those stand, but the, the four tendencies, it, it is, it sounds very similar to like how you experience men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Like I listen to it. I don't think I've ever listened to a funnier book, a funnier personal development book ever. I mean, it's the whole book is about, I'm um, just the, the discussion of how one responds to inner expectation and outer expectation. And she somehow she's she's figured out how to write the quiet part right how to write what everybody's thinking very few people say out loud what they're thinking because it's like not kosher to say what you're thinking all the time well she wrote down like oh somebody asked you to do this and this is what your first thought is I'm like oh my gosh she nailed me perfect so it's fantastic if you want to create have a language right because communication is all about languages and especially in relationships when you have two people coming together um, what I found is because they come from two different language patterns in different homes, they need a new language pattern that is their own so they can communicate clearly together. And uh, this gave me a language to then introduce to not just my wife, but all of my siblings, um, everybody around me. I introduced, hey, this is a good language pattern for us to negotiate on. And this is how I like to be communicated to. And it gave me a language to express how I like to be communicated to. So phenomenal book. I think you'd get a lot of benefit out of it. Um, just, just to give you another piece in your tool belt. That was great. Yeah, it, it's fantastic. So um, one question on here we didn't get to, but I, I'm going to ask it um, before I ask the final question. What are some things in, in your mind, just to close up, I know it's kind of a strange note to end on, but maybe we'll, we'll, flip the coin as well, but what are some things that you, in your mind or what you've seen, absolutely poison a relationship? Uh, one of the biggest ones would be control. You know, women do not want to be controlled physically by a man. Uh, neither spouse wants to be controlled financially. Men don't want to be controlled sexually uh, by either withholding affection, withholding sex. So reality is we have to treat each other with respect. And control is the opposite of respect. So control to me is relationship poison. Uh, contempt is another one. Uh, criticism. There's very little your spouse does that they don't already know when they screwed up. I told you so is never really very helpful. But when you look at those kind of on a spectrum, uh, you know, criticism is, is bad. Condemnation is bad. But control is to me poison. You really, if one spouse is intent upon controlling the other one, 
that's pretty much a toxic relationship and probably one that won't survive and shouldn't survive. Awesome. I mean, not, not awesome that <laughs> that's the answer, but it is that we can, we can hear it and uh, we can analyze our own relationships based on those questions you asked us and say, okay, well, how are we uh, contributing or, or detracting from a good relationship? So what are some things viewers give us like, three things that are keys to successful relationships? Listening correctly, respect, and trust. Because trust and respect are, are the pillars. They're the foundation stones of love. And the, the, both of those, to some extent, rely on in the integrity of the other person. So one of the examples that I use in the, in the events is, what's the standard answer your woman gives when you say, what's wrong, honey? What's the answer, Sam? What do you My do? wife, um, most of the time she said, well, she will, she will either tell me, um, or if she's not ready to talk about it, then she'll say, um, I'm not ready to talk about it. We'll talk about it once I've figured it out. That's awesome because Perfect. that's what I counsel women to do. <laughs> the 99% answer is nothing. And here's the problem with nothing. It's not honest. The woman knows it's not honest. The man knows it's not honest. And he knows she knows it's not honest. The answer that your wife gave is perfect. I'm not ready to talk about it yet. That means he's in trouble and he knows that, but he's not lied to. Because when you lie, if, if, if you lie to each other about little things, why would you trust on big things like fidelity? So never ever lie to your spouse. I'm not ready to talk about it is a brutally honest, beautiful answer. I love it. Yeah, it's a, I'm, I'm very grateful for my wife. She's, she's amazing, and I'm glad that we found each other. It's a miracle that we did, but I'm glad she puts up with me because I know I'm not the easiest person to live with. But. Believe me, I second that. My wife would second that motion a heartbeat. And she, she deserves a sainthood, a medal, or combat pay, or maybe all three. Yeah, absolutely. So, so here's the last question. My, it's my favorite question, so I leave it for last. But we've got to pretend that you're dead, you died, right? You, this is going to be multiple generations because you're going to live until you're 120, you say. But um, we're talking six generations down from you. So your great, 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 great grandchildren are all sitting around a table talking about your legacy. What do you want them to be saying about the legacy of Stan? They loved our great, great, great grandmother, that he loved our great, great, great grandmother. And he did, and everything he did was just for his family. Awesome. Yeah, I, I love it. Thank you so much for, for joining us on Fuel Your Legacy. And all the links that we talked about are going to be in the show notes for, for you guys. And if you guys would like um, access to more of his information, definitely go to his website. Go engage with him on Facebook. I can't say enough about this guy. I, I loved him from the first, like, honestly, when we first met each other. Um, at the retreat, I, I knew I could trust him. He, he's very honest. He's upfront. He's he's direct. He doesn't uh, dance around things. He just says what needs to be said. And I really appreciate that and respect you for that, Sam. Because it's there's a lot of people who don't do that. And uh, knowing who you're dealing with, I think is is one of the often it can be one of the hardest things to identify, especially in the world we live in today. But uh, since since I've met you and uh, while I met you, I never saw you act inconsistent with how you profess to live your life. And that I think is, um, th that there's nothing, I don't think there could be a better thing said about anybody. At, I appreciate at that. Thank so, you very much, Sam. Yeah, no problem. And we'll catch you guys next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Thanks for joining us today. If what you heard resonated with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me so I can give you a shout out on the next episode. And thanks to all those who have left a review. It helps spread the message of what it really takes to build a legacy that lasts. Catch you next time on Feeling Your Legacy.